girls, welcome to Mrs. Stalzik's Classroom Workshop. Today we are outside again and we are going to talk about something. It's something that surrounds us. It's something that I can see right outside my house. It's something that when we go out to the park at the playground at school, we look out onto this. That same thing we're looking out on at school is the same thing that we can see right here. And depending on the tide, it can come all the way up to here. Does anybody know what that is that we're looking at or what we're going to talk about? Do you have an idea? If you said the Columbia River, you are right. We're going to be talking today a little bit about the Columbia River. So I'm going to read to you some facts about the Columbia River. Okay? Can you hold this for me, Anna? Yeah. So we're going to move up just a little bit closer. The Columbia River is the largest river in the Pacific Northwest region of North America. It flows northwest and then south into the United States and of Washington, then turns west to form most of the border between Washington and the state of Oregon before emptying into the Pacific Ocean. The river is 1,243 miles long and its largest tributary is the Snake River. Its drainage basin is roughly the size of France and extends into seven U.S. states and a Canadian province. By volume, the fourth largest river in the United States. The fourth largest by volume. The Columbia has the greatest flow of any North American river entering the Pacific. The historical significance of the Columbia River spans thousands of years in which humans have interacted with the river ecosystem. The Columbia River's watershed, and the watershed is an area of land that is drained by the river, is approximately 259,000 square miles and drains parts of, into seven states in the Canadian province, British um, Columbia. The watershed provides habitat for 609 known fish and wildlife species, including the bull trout, bald eagle, if you're watching you may see one fly by, gray wolf, grizzly bear, and Canada lynx. The Columbia River watershed has been inhabited by people for as many as 15,000 years. So way before. The Columbia River has served as a transportation route since ancient times, as well as a source for drinking water, irrigation, and fishing. A large part of the Columbia River is part of where we get our drinking water all up and down it. The river system hosts many species of Andronomous fish, which migrate between freshwater habitats and the saline waters of the Pacific Ocean. These fish, especially the salmon species, provided the core substance for native peoples. It is believed that the Columbia River Basin was formed at the end of the last ice age when melting ice formed ice dams and periodic flooding approximately 12,000 to 19,000 years ago. So imagine. The Columbia River was given the name it bears today in May 1792 by American Captain Robert Gray. Some of you might have heard that. After his ship, the Columbia Rediva Gray, Rediva Gray and his British and a British captain, George Vancouver, who explored the river in 1792, proved that it was possible to cross the Columbia Bar. Yeah. So up until that point, the Columbia River had different names. It was gone by Big River, the river, but until he, pa um, until he went through it on his ship, the Columbia, that's when it got its official name, so in 1792. The Columbia River was inhabited by Native Americans and explorers before arriving in the region in the 1700s, including Alexander Mackenzie in 1793. In the early 1800s, Lewis and Clark arrived in the Oregon region and discovered the natives had already engaged in trade with foreigners. 
Fishing has been an important activity in the Columbia River for as long as the region has been inhabited. It is estimated that prehistoric figures of steelhead and salmon reach 10 to 16 million. Today, not that many, but back then, that's a lot of fish. There are 14, 14 hydroelectric dams along the Columbia River. The Columbia River is responsible for one third of the hydro potential in the United States. And there are also more than 450 other dams in the Columbia River watershed. So these are just some of the facts, some of the, the main ones. Um, I wanted to share if you're curious about finding out more about the Columbia River, you can get online. There's lots of information. Um, when this is over, you can go visit the Maritime Museum and get lots of information. I did a little research of what I had in my house from some um, books that were written by local people. I have a pioneer scrapbook. Columbia River North Shore Communities, um, written by Carlton E. Apello. Um, this one, The End of the Lewis and Clark Trail, Columbia River, written by Brian Pentela. And I also um, got this one, In Full View, by Rex Zeke. So these ones are um, have great information, and I kind of gathered some stuff from them to kind of give you a little bit on my report. Um, I thought it was neat when I was going through this one because it gave examples and some drawings and some collections from Lewis and Clark in their journal. And that part that I talked about when Lewis and Clark came, it says here that um, they had been coming, Captain Robert had come, and it was at this time that they found that they were already using this area for mm -hmm. trade when they came and they discovered it. And here is kind of a picture to show. So full of lots of information. And this one I just wanted to highlight a picture that I, a couple of pictures that I found that I thought were interesting to kind of share. Here's what life on the river would have looked like and how they would have moved things back and forth. So I find the Columbia River fascinating. I grew up on the Columbia River three miles from where I am now, and the river was my backyard. Um, myself, my brother, and my sisters, the four of us, we would go into our backyard, we would climb down a little hill, cross the railroad track, because at that time the railroad ran every day in front of our house, get onto a boat that my dad and grandpa had built for us kids. It was made out of recycled wood, it was rectangular shape. It floated by using milk cartons filled with styrofoam. So we collected those milk cartons um, and then we would fill them back then. A lot of things were packaged in styrofoam because we didn't know then what we do. But instead of us throwing them out, we used the styrofoam and stuffed them into those milk cartons and we built a boat that floated. And us kids would go out onto the river and we would be there all day without our parents, I know, weird. Um, and we would float and we would pretend fish with our homemade fishing poles. We would swim, we would talk, we would visit, do all kinds of things. So the water has always been a special place for me and my family. And um, it was just always so neat watching my dad and my grandpa build those boats. They could walk on those logs on the water and just balance on them. It was so amazing. And we had to uh, watch the tide because sometimes we would be out too long and the tide would go out and we would be stuck out there in the mug box. And we'd have to wait and my mom would be standing kind of like where we are now and she'd look out into the water to see if she could see us. We could see the ships coming. And uh, we'd wave to her and let her know, hey, we're still okay, we'll be back. But um, we named, we had a big boat named the Ark, and then we had another one later that we named Swampy. And I think we came up with the name Swampy because we got stuck out there quite a bit. But I just kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Columbia River because it's, it, it is fascinating. There's lots of history in our area. Um, we see it every day when we're at school um, for a lot of families. 
um, the Columbia River was a way for them to um, to support their families. So the water is very important. For us, it's very peaceful and relaxing. Um, when I moved, I wanted to make sure I got back to the water. There's just something about it. Um, this is also Poetry Month. So I was going to read a poem to you that I found about the river. And then I was going to encourage you to do a couple of things. Um, I want you to see if you can see the river from your house. Maybe you could write a poem about the river. Um, if not, maybe my video will give you some inspiration about the, the river. We're also going to give you a challenge. See if you can make a boat that would float. Test it out in your sink or your bathtub. Um, you could use aluminum foil to make a boat. You could use um, wood. But use things like we did, I was talking about, that would go out recycled material and see if you can make one that will float. Um, if you join us um, on our next video, we're going to show you how to draw the river and you can color it or paint it. Okay, so I'm going to leave you today with a poem. It's called Drifting by Lenore Hetrick. Drifting down a sleepy stream in a red canoe underneath the water green up above the blue for pleasure and for quiet fun what better could you do drifting down a sleepy stream with the world so still past the birch tree in the hollow past the old sawmill past a little waterfall past a little hill there are souls who like to frolic in a lively way there are others who like to climb mountains on a sunny day, but drifting down a sleepy stream is always just my way. So that's a little bit about us and a little bit about the river. And my daughters are learning how to enjoy the Columbia River too when we get out onto the water, don't you girls? All right, so we hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the Columbia River. And we encourage you to write a poem, to build a boat that will float, to look into more about the river, ask your families, find out all the information you can, and then join us for our next video as we show you how to draw a river. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.